Good evening. In this program, we'll be discussing the escalation of tensions between United States and Turkey. The American government recently placed severe sanctions on Turkey's economy for refusing to release American pastor Branson, detained for almost two years, sparking a currency crisis. Yet Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan seems to be adamant not to give in to their demands. My guests are Mr. Nicholas Danford, Senior Policy Analyst uh, of Bipartisan Policy Center for National Security Affairs, and he has been writing extensively about Turkey, U.S. foreign policy, and the Middle East affairs. Also, we are hosting Mr. Ryan Gingeras, an Associate Professor in the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School in California. He is an expert on Turkish, Balkan, and Middle East history. He has books on the last era of Ottoman Empire and a biography of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we choose the title of your co-written recent article as the title of this program. And if I understood it correctly, the abyss you mentioned in your article is the place where both Turkey and the United States could find themselves in after a possible breakup of their relations, since they both seem to be unprepared. Um, let me ask you first, how serious is the situation right now? Well, I, I think it's very serious. Um, I think what's most serious about it is that um, we are really uncertain about what the possible outcomes are. Um, the situation looks really unstable. Um, it seems like any number of different factors could, you know, could make uh, relations worse. Uh, could um, create um, not just you know problems between the United States and Turkey, but just uh, regionally, uh, perhaps even globally, considering what the economic stakes are. So uh, I think there. It's a we chose the title Abyss for the article because it is the unknown and it's um, uh, it's uh, just unclear where, where it's all headed. Um, I just add. Oh, yes, sorry. yes, please do so. No, you know, for the past decade, maybe longer, it seems like uh, every time there's been a crisis between the United States and Turkey, someone said it's unprecedented. Someone said this is the worst point of U.S.-Turkish relations since the beginning of the Cold War. And as a historian, I've always been very skeptical of that. I've always been quick to say, you know, things were always worse in the past than we sometimes remember. Even in the golden age, things were, there were more problems than both sides would like to admit. Uh, but after about 10 years of saying this, I'm finally at the point where I think, no, this is the worst they've been. This is really unprecedented. Uh, but as you mentioned in your article, there's a belief around here that uh, sooner or later, the American administration, Trump's administration, will back down. And do you think, is it baseless? I mean, can U.S. Afford, afford to lose Turkey? No. Hey, go ahead. Oh, no, I think that's what's so worrying and what we tried to highlight in the report, that there's, there are almost identical assumptions on both sides. Uh, both sides want the relationship to continue, but they want the relationship to continue on their terms. Uh, and moreover, yeah. both sides think that because they're the indispensable partner, that because the other side needs them more uh, than they need the other one, uh, that at the end of the day, as you say, when push comes to shove, I think both Washington and Ankara actually in very similar ways expect the other side to back down. Uh, and it's precisely this mutual belief, it's precisely the certainty on both sides uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, the other party will come to its senses uh, that could lead to a crisis. Can I jump in just really quick? Yes, um, yes, yes. Always you feel free to tell anything you want for a question, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, I think I would qualify that just a little bit. I, I think that when you're talking about the United States and in Turkey in terms of foreign policy communities or expectations, I think you have to approach it a little bit, um, you know, a little bit differently for, for either side. I think that the American foreign policy community has conflicting expectations because there are multiple actors who participate in the foreign policy process, both inside and outside of government. And I think that in, um, 
in different elements of the government, for sure, there is an expectation of things getting worse. There's an expectation of things uh, perhaps um, never quite recovering. And there are also different, but there's also um, a you know certain impulses to try to improve it you know improve the relationship if for no other reason to not create further problems for areas which are greater significance whether it's in the case of Iran or um, counter ISIS campaign and so forth I think when you look at Turkey when you talk about what expectations are and how people perceive the problem I think you have to take a very different approach because we don't really at least from the outside looking in, we don't know that much about what constitutes this community. The only thing we can say for certain is that Erdogan has a far greater influence over the overall direction of foreign policy than any single actor within the United States. So yeah. in, in the end, when we, have, when we ask ourselves, you know, what does Ankara want and what does it expect, in some ways, we, ha we are really focusing much more on what does Erdogan want and expect, where in the case of the United States, there are more stakeholders that have far greater influence than any particular element of the Turkish government. Um, you mentioned conflicting expectations. Maybe one can argue or from where I look at, we, can, we sometimes think that there are also conflicting acts or policies or uh, words, uh, you know, sayings uh, regarding the U.S. policies actually uh, about Turkey, about Middle East, you know, the region. Maybe this is, uh, this gives um, uh, for Turkish uh, government um, a thinking that uh, there might be a crack in, in their sense. I mean, uh, how do you respond to this kind of thinking? Maybe Ryan, I should add up to that. Um, your um, uh, your tweet uh, actually saying that a number of recent events suggest that there is alarming lack of understanding of the U.S. in Ankara. Uh, I mean, yeah, could you a little bit elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, I guess on the one hand, I think it, it seems that the policy community in Ankara is relatively confident that since the foreign policy community in, Turkey, in the United States is relatively fragmented, that there is a policy process in which different elements of the government come together or don't come together or come, you know, or, or come to disagreement on different issues, that that will lead to not just incoherency, but perhaps um, it could be used against the United States as a way, to, as a negotiating tactic. Um, now, at the same time, I think what it seems likely, too, is that at least in terms of policy commentators in the press, as well as perhaps even elements of Erdogan's government as well, that there is an overestimation or an underestimation of the different weight and influence of different elements of the policy community, um, whether it's the influence of the Department of Defense, whether it's the influence of the president himself. Um, it's, uh, it, at times, I think that there is there, there, are, there are plenty of room for miscalculation, as well as a sort of clear misunderstanding of, what, um, uh, of how the policy process actually works. Nicholas, would you, on, yeah, please. So, no, I pick up on that for just a minute to say, I think part of that, what brought us to the point that we're at right now is that there was a split within the policy community. There were a number of people, uh, you know, particularly in the executive branch, who were eager to have a more accommodating policy towards Turkey, uh, who were pushing back when, say, the United States Congress uh, wanted to sanction Turkey. And you did have a little bit of back and forth. Uh, and you had the people who were, in a sense, defending Turkey, uh, who were more critical of U.S. policy on issues like the YPG, uh, who I think gradually, as this crisis boiled over, as the issue of Brunson uh, became personal for the White House, uh, as the people in the State Department who were saying that they could work out a deal to get Brunson released if only we held off on sanctions, uh, as their argument was discredited, that tipped the balance. That put the, that put the weight in the hands of the people who for much longer had been saying, the only way we're going to get results is if we get tough. Uh, and what you see is the president after having been a force checking that impulse, now very eagerly, very enthusiastically, over eagerly, uh, has jumped on board with the people who were saying 
we have to get tough on Erdogan. Right. Uh, why, both of you, while um, discussing these um, corners of the uh, situation, uh, you also stress the um, imbalance of the, uh, the asymmetry of power between the two countries, which uh, Turkey seems to be um, underestimating, maybe. Um, and also, which makes me to come to the um, point uh, that, because he's recently um, appointed to the Syria uh, affairs of the uh, State Department, James Jeffrey's description of Turkey, um, it was about Turkey's Middle East pol policy, but maybe we can uh, stretch it to a much more general standing that um, uh, Rolls-Royce ambitions, but with rover resources. <laughs> do you agree to that? I mean, uh, who is, uh, is Turkey more to lose, do you think, uh, if the things get worse and the, the relations collapse? I think definitely. Uh, I think while, I, I, I think the fundamental matter is that Turkey, for Turkey, the United States is a really, is an undoubtedly critical actor. And, you know, both in potentially being, playing a positive role in um, promoting Turkish security uh, uh, as, a, as a force multiplier in Turkey's own foreign policy interests in the region, but it also can play a negative role and in a way that could be, uh, I think, as demonstrated in the last couple of weeks, quite devastating. Um, on the flip side, I think that, you know, for American policymakers, Turkey is a very important actor, but it, I, it, I don't think you can quite equate the way in which Turks see the United States with the way the United States sees Turkey. Um, Turkey is an important actor. It's not an essential actor. And considering that the way in which American relations with Turkey has largely and almost exclusively uh, resided within the realm of security, uh, I think that while it's not advantageous and it's not something that people are, are eagerly seeking, it is possible for American policymakers to pivot away from Turkey. I don't know if that same um, if Turkey has that same ability to vote to compensate for some sort of lack of American support, or more importantly, um, compensate for outright antagonism with the United States. Would you like to add up, Chris, uh, Nicholas? It, maybe I'd add only, I mean, right, if Turkey is committed to pursuing an independent foreign policy, I, either independent of America or even uh, working against America, I mean, it certainly can. It certainly has options. It will find, uh, it will find new partners. But that process, those new partners, will also bring uh, new requirements, new sacrifices, new consequences. Uh, you know, there seems like a certain irony after jailing Andrew Brunson and provoking a crisis with the United States by refusing to release him. Uh, Turkey then found itself in a position where it was trying to pivot to the EU to gain EU support, and in doing that, it had to release a German journalist and two jailed Greek soldiers that it was holding. Uh, so in the, there are trade-offs like that. Uh, even more dramatically, I think you could see, or you're unfortunately probably going to see, uh, in Syria, in the case of Idlib, right. if the, uh, Turkey wants to pursue uh, improved relations with Russia, uh, Russia is going to um, demand something in return, and if that's uh, Turkey standing by while Assad's forces, you know, Idlib, uh, maybe then try to move on to Afrin or Jarablus. Uh, Turkey on its own is going to be in a very difficult position trying to resist, uh, trying to resist Russia. Can I just follow up with one quick thing? Please. Uh, I think it depends where you're talking about, whether it, you're talking about in the short term or in the long term. And I think in the short, short, short term, I, I think Nick is absolutely right that if Turkey decides to take a much more independent or contrarian role to the United States, it's going to, be, it's going to have to rely upon short-term negotiations with a series of different states in which you, Turkey may not only not get what it wants, but it may actually have to give up things that perhaps it doesn't want to. And it's not, you know, and it's not entirely clear what those things could be. The real question is all you know, the other question is whether what this is indicative of long-term trends, and whether or not Turkey 
is on some sort of path that leads it to take a generally you know, independent or oppositional role to the United States. In which case, what we definitely have to consider is, you know, does Turkey want to forge relations uh, or foreign, you know, contract, you know, some sort of contractual relationships with the various states that are analogous to what, you know, how the United States and Turkey have interacted in the past, whether on a bilateral level or via NATO or what have you. So all said and done, I think it it's really not clear whether, you know, this is indicative of a short-term problem or a long-term problem. Right. Uh, in your article, you, um, you urge or uh, invite uh, American policymakers to uh, think about the situation in a much more realistic sense and uh, this, uh, think of policies uh, in case uh, that the, this relationship collapse. Um, and uh, our colleague, my colleague, Ambedin Zaman, recently wrote to Al Monitor and, um, about this uh, standoff between Turkey and the United States. And um, ac according to the analysts it spoke to, um, it is, uh, he said it is possible that the administration is indeed using uh, Professor Branson uh, not as, as a tool to really, uh, you know, uh, his vote uh, from evangelicals, though, but uh, as an excuse to pursue a long overdue realist approach to Turkey. Do you agree on this? Is there a change in that sense? Go ahead, Nick. I'd say on both sides, it seems very clear that Pastor Brunson uh, has become a symbol for all the frustrations uh, that exist in this relationship. Uh, and it's, you know, how that exactly came to be the case, whatever mix of domestic politics, miscalculation, personal pique on Trump's part made this so central. Now that Brunson has become a symbol, I think. Both sides see this as a point in which they have to prevail. The United States sees this, uh, you know, if they can't use uh, America's enormous leverage at a time of Turkey's economic weakness to secure the release of one person, uh, that's going to say something, from America's point of view, very discouraging about the relationship. And I think in parallel to that, people in Turkey see that if they give in to U.S. pressure in releasing Brunson, that will create the expectation that they in on a number of more practical issues. Yeah, I I don't really know. I don't know if this is indicative of a a reassessment or a general reassessment of Turkish US relations. Um, especially for the fact that this um, what's really at issue is um, President Trump's handling of this specific crisis, particularly, you know, namely um, leveraging tariffs as well as sanctions uh, against the Turkish government and, and the Turkish state as a whole. Uh, I think it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point there is a resolution to this, you know, to this crisis and we somehow pivot back to muddling through a series of other different, uh, different other issues that are stand out between the two countries. I, I think for um, what we had in mind in terms of this report was to handle the, the more narrow question of, are we at a breaking point and what does that mean? And I think that the, the more specific takeaway that we tried to impart was, number one, um, no one's anticipating a, a breaking point. And secondly, that there is an expectation that this, you know, that there are still there's still room for negotiation, and that this will kind of con this will continue on, and that there isn't some sort of magic, um, you know, kind of edge of the cliff or sort of some sort of imaginary edge of the cliff in which the side goes off. Now, having said that, um, like I said at the top, anything can really happen at this point. I think that's um, that's where you know the abyss is, is that there's a, a great series of different potential factors that could lead to a dramatic worsening of the crisis and, um, you know, really disastrous, for, which would lead to really disastrous consequences from not just the U.S.-Turkish relationship, but, you know, regionally, globally, perhaps as well. Um, 
It is a very important point, and I will return to that. I mean, being on the edge of a cliff uh, for Turkey, actually. But uh, you have been uh, for uh, drawing attention for a possible fallout uh, for some time, actually. You both wrote articles uh, for the uh, Bipartisan Policy uh, Center. Um, and one, in one of them, for example, you were mentioning uh, it was about regarding the, uh, the corruption in Turkey. And um, it was also uh, it was also another point to show that the um, Turkey U.S. relations uh, could severe because of the way uh, the corruption is uh, included into the system in Turkey. But uh, I will quote this part: Turkey's foreign policy interests are not simply uh, misaligned with the with those of the United States, but mutually antagonistic. Could you add a bit? Elaborate on that. I mean, not only because you mention it, uh, or we mention it, like Turkey is uh, uh, choosing to buy uh, S400s rather than uh, other things from United States, kind of thing. But it's, it's, I think, more important than the uh, national security uh, documents that the um, uh, Trump administration recently put forward. I think it's, it's showing some uh, clear picture of where the United States wants to go, even if Mr. Trump doesn't seem to uh, act accordingly every time. But he's also unpredictable uh, as our leader. Well, let me, no, I mean, I guess I just start off by saying, I think the, um, I think the upcoming, what's gonna be a, a most likely an upcoming fight over U.S.-Iran sanctions is a good example of where these very divergent interests to the fore. Uh, the United States, the Trump administration, but also with considerable support from other aspects of the national security apparatus, has been very eager to impose new sanctions on Iran. Uh, Turkey has been very defiant in saying that it's not going to go along with those sanctions. But independent of whether you think Trump's policy is a good one, independent of whether you think Turkey's policy is a good one, uh, the difference in opinion uh, couldn't be starker. In this, you know, we've already seen the long-term consequences of what happened when Obama imposed sanctions on Iran, uh, and the Turkish government did not go along with them. The resulting Halk Bank case has been at the center of uh, the U.S.-Turkish conflict over the last several years. Again, independent of which side you think is right in this, uh, it's the conflict between what both sides uh, have done and what both sides are saying they're going to do is fairly stark. Yeah, and I think to follow up on that, it's really clear that the two countries have very different perceptions of security in the region. Turkey has a much more um, complex relationship with Iran, with Russia, with Syria. And I think even more than that, the United States represents to Turkey something very different than what Turkey represents to the United States and to American foreign policymakers. And I think you see it in Turkish rhetoric, you see it in um, commentaries within the, you know, in the press, and even to the degree to which you have something like a kind of academic foreign policy community in Turkey. And I think what it, you know, the sum of it, uh, uh, of all of this says, is that Turkey represents something, that the United States represents something existentially challenging to Turkey. It's, you know, either as a rival or as an adversary on the regional stage and on a global stage. And that um, the test of the Erdogan government and for future policymakers is to meet that challenge either through um, go, uh, uh, formulating policies independent of the United States, or perhaps you know aligning itself with uh, other regional actors, either to promote Turkey's own in independent policy, or more specifically to combat policies um, being enacted by the United States that Turkey finds threatening.
Exactly. I mean, uh, what maybe I'm oversimplifying the national security policy document, but um, it, it says to me, uh, for example, that uh, Russia is obviously an adversary and uh, Iran is an enemy, kind of, you know, simplification to it. And uh, anyone who is uh, in between them, I mean, Russia, uh, the US, and these uh, countries, then, you know, will be defying um, United States uh, will on that sense. Anyways, but uh, can I return back to the Iranian, upcoming Iranian, uh, new part of the uh, Iranian sanctions? As uh, Nicholas mentioned, um, but uh, Turkey has recently, yes, um, had a sanction busting, busting scheme and uh, it's paying a price for it, or maybe not really yet paid whole price. But, uh, but you, uh, now Europe, also wants to evade the sanctions, and it seems that uh, you know they are into making some uh, uh, cooperation with Turkey in that sense. Um, th 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 this, doesn't this uh, encourage Turkey? Yeah, I think there's very much a race between Erdogan and the world faster and more effectively. Uh, Erdogan had a good head start, but you know, Trump has been catching up. <laughs> and, you know, right, part of the, by bringing in a little bit of our own domestic politics here in the United States, I mean, part of what I thought was admirable about the way Obama pursued sanctions against Iran is that he did it very carefully. He did it in coordination with the United States' other allies. Uh, he brought the Europeans on board. Uh, and exactly, Trump's attempt to uh, impose new sanctions with coordinating with other European allies, uh, it does make it, uh, increases their resentment, uh, and as you said, increases their sympathy with Turkey if Turkey decides it's not going to go along with these. I, I think I, I think that's definitely true, and I think it, it also speaks to a core assumption within uh, Turkish foreign policy, and I think this is something that Erdogan understands and, and projects very well, is the idea that Turkey has options that um, depending on the issue, depending upon the, um, upon the crisis, Turkey can resort to balancing between the United States and perhaps Europe, or perhaps Russia, or perhaps Iran, or perhaps China. And that this flexibility allows Turkey greater leverage in dealing with issues that the United States you know, finds important, but Turkey may find problematic for it. Now, the, the question is, is at some point, is Turkey still capable um, to, to maintain this balancing act? Um, I mean, you mentioned you know, the, the fact that Turkey in, in, in Europe or states in Europe will find some sort of mutual accommodation regarding Iranian sanctions. That, that may be the case, but in, there may be yet other problems that uh, emerge that will complicate uh, an arrangement such as this, you know, whether it's uh, a bailout from Germany or the issue of refugees, human rights, uh, perhaps, you know, Kurdish issues, you name it. I mean, there are, up, there are a variety of different ways in which, you know, Tur you know, Turkey's ability to balance its, you know, relationships between, a, you know, between a variety of different powers can be undone. And um, maybe as a last question, uh, let's return back to the edge of the cliff. Uh, and um, is there any way, uh, do you think, uh, to take down these two uh, alleys, old alleys, uh, from this edge? I mean, in a sense that because both um, uh, Trump and uh, Erdogan acts like, you know, two goats on a bridge, um, is this uh, can diplomacy work, or really it is the end of those kind of you know uh, daily remedies? Ryan, do you want to, do you have anything more optimistic to say than I do? <laughs> yeah, I guess I do. I think uh, you know I wouldn't discount inertia in all of this. Um, I think when we talk about what a break is, I don't think we've ever really defined it. You know, what is a break between the U.S. and Turkish relations? Is it, you know, simply withdrawing ambassadors? Is it closing down Injilic? Is it something else? Uh, no one's really ever made clear what this break is. And I think more than anything, um, 
I wouldn't discount, um, at least in the United States, some degree of risk aversion or conflict aversion still being a factor in how policymakers approach Turkey. And I think that there's still some degree of, uh, of in, you know, of, of enthusiasm in Washington to try to just keep the situation muddling ar- along and that things may not improve, but at least they're not going to, you know, at least there will be attempts to try to not aggravate the, the situation further. But again, it, that all could change with a tweet. It can change with changes in the, uh, in the lira. It can change in any number of different factors. So uh, that's the most optimistic I can sort of do at present. Uh, could I add something before uh, giving the floor to the Nicholas? Um, uh, it is as something you also put it on Twitter, uh, Ryan, that is that, I mean, any policy decision by the United States at this point will probably be used against it by uh, Recep Tayyip, uh, President Erdogan. And if the U.S. concedes anything, uh, President Erdogan will try to profit from it. I mean, he's... Uh, it, this is the best situation, it looks like, for him, the status quo. Well, that's sort of, you know, on the flip side of everything I just said, the really negative aspect of <laughs> that you could um, see in here and be, you know, particularly pessimistic is the fact that Erdogan is not so conflict-averse. Um, he actually clearly thrives on conflict um, in general. And more importantly, he's made the United States and sort of in uh, developing a Turkish foreign policy that is independent or contrary to the United States as essentially the alpha and the omega of his administration. Uh, this, uh, this path forward to me seems certainly to be going in different directions. It's really more about how it's managed and whether or not the United States remains somewhat risk averse in dealing with with Turkey or or not. Um, And the degree to which Turkey can perhaps at some point or another um, find some sort of face saving measure to make make sure that matters don't get that much worse. But I don't see any particular guardrails where that, you know, would be the case. And maybe I'd add, it's the propensity for conflict and to take uh, what you could almost call symbolically antagonistic steps that worries me so much. There were a lot of things that Ankara did that the United States was unhappy with, uh, whether it was the sanctions busting, whether it was buying, planning to buy the S-400s, whether it was the invasion of Afrin, whether it was support for al-Nusra in Idlib. The enormous sources of frustration in Washington None of those provoked the sanctions, none of those provoked the talk of sanctions, none of those provoked the backlash that the arrest of Professor Brunson. Uh, By the same token, I've always said, there have been a number of people arrested in Turkey, a number of people whose arrests, yeah, people in the United States who followed this were upset about. None of that registered in Washington until there was an attack on protesters outside the ambassador's residence in Washington, D.C. That's something that friends I have from, you know, back home who don't follow international politics, that's what they now think of when they think of Erdogan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's, you know, you can imagine an approach from the Turkish government where they did a whole lot of things that Washington didn't like, but avoided the deliberate provocation, uh, and it might turn out okay. It's the propensity for deliberate provocation, uh, which I think uh, gets through very effectively. That's something that resonates with people in the United States. It's something that, you know, strikes a chord and speaks to America's national pride. And that's in part more than the practical issues, what gets a reaction uh, and what could bring us to a level of, you know, a point in the abyss that's not in anyone's interest. So I couldn't leave you, sorry, just last question. So are we expecting, uh, though, although we didn't decide what is really the break means, but are we expecting a Turkish initiated rupture or break or the US initiated one? I mean, do you want odds? I mean, we could, I would say the odds of a uh, Turkish uh, initiated break is higher than say a US initiated break, but 
Um, I think you, I, I, I would put the odds on that still relatively low, uh, you know, uh, on both sides. Uh, I don't, I would say that historically, as Nick pointed out, there's much more um, incentive on Turkey's side to behave provocatively as opposed to the U.S., you know, as opposed to the United States. Having said that, given the domestic um, politics uh, of the United States at present, given the nature of uh, President Trump as a, you know, as a political actor, um, that may all change. We don't really know. Uh, but having said that, I think that if you were going to look at this problem in the long term, I think you know what's pretty clear is that not only has you know the United States come to represent something quite um, antagonistic in some ways, sort of existentially provocative within you know the Turkish imagination. I think Erdogan's uh, evolution as an authoritarian leader, as uh, an aggressive actor in the Middle East has changed the political climate quite a bit in Washington in terms of how uh, the broader spectrum of policymakers see Turkey. I think that there was, you know, until relatively recently, there were a fair number of commentators, people who work in government, who could have been somewhat sympathetic to Turkish um, perceptions of the region or just Turkish, Turkey's status uh, as an ally um, of the United States, I'm not sure that that uh, that that subset of American policymaker or commentator is that big anymore. In fact, I think it's shrinking by the day. And Nicholas, would you like to add up the last sentence <laughs> or no, last I, you know, Yeah. I follow up what both uh, you and Ryan said that at the same time. You know, you mentioned Trump's approach to Iran. Uh, I think there is increasingly a sense of, this is actually George Bush's line, but all the more so for the Trump regime, you're with us or against us. You know, you're on our side or you're on Russia and Iran's side. And if that's the potential attitude that I think, as Turkey's trying to pursue a more independent foreign policy, uh, if you have policymakers in Washington who have even less sympathy than previous policymakers might have, for Ankara or any other country pursuing an independent foreign policy, uh, that could create a situation uh, where you know it's not one side or the other initiating the break, but you know again both sides stumbling into something without expecting it. Uh, um, Brian Jindras and uh, Nicholas Danford, thank you very much for being with us uh, tonight, joining us. Um, thank you. It was a really uh, mind-opening uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you much. Good night. Good night. Have a good night. Uh, Thanks again. And we are uh, finishing this program tonight and uh, in, on Medioscope TV our programs will start tomorrow morning.